So let's get started with the B cell development. We want to now figure out how does the B cell make its B cell receptor and how does a B cell progress through several stages. So the B cell will become a very sophisticated cell, it will be able to make antibodies. So it needs to go through a very specific education and this education happens in the bone marrow. And the B cell goes through several stages. It starts as a progenitor, also referred as pro-B cell, then becomes a precursor, a pre-B cell, then an immature B cell, and then at one point it becomes a naive B cell. And this naive B cell will then eventually leave the bone marrow to recirculate between secondary lymphoid organs. For example, to hang out in the lymph node where it's going to wait if it becomes activated. How are we going to make now the B cell receptor? We're going to start with the heavy chain. The heavy chain consists out of a constant domain, which is always the same, and the variable region, which gives us the diversity. So how do we get this huge diversity in the variable region of the heavy chain? This is facilitated by so-called VDG rearrangement. So we are just going to join different DNA segments randomly together. So imagine you are the chef of a huge dinner party and there's going to be a million guests coming and you have no idea what they want to eat and they're very picky and annoying. So you have to generate now a million different meals. And that's really the same scenario as we are facing when we are threatened by different pathogens. We don't know who is going to come and against whom we need to make antibodies. So how are we going to make all these different receptors, or if you stay with our chef analogy, all the different meals? Let's suppose the heavy chain recombination is the main course. So if you want to create a lot of variation in the main course, what you're going to have now is you have three categories. Let's say V is stands for vegetables. So you're going to choose tomatoes, zucchini, onions, peppers, carrots, eggplants, broccoli, and so on and so forth. Imagine there are 100 different choices of vegetables. I'm just going to draw out now four. Then you're going to choose meat. So for example, you have beef, pork, chicken, tuna, crab, lamb. So you get one of those. Let's say you're going to have 27 options of meat. I'm just going to draw out now four. And then you have J. And that stands for the carbs. So you can choose rice, spaghetti, fries, bread, baked potatoes. And let's just suppose you have in reality eight different choices. And now I'm going to draw out just six. And you're going to be now this master cook. And that's the enzyme rag that is going to pick randomly one V, so one vegetable, one meat, and one carb. So, for example, this meal that we're going to cook now consists of tomato, chicken, bread. But that's just one example that I drew out. In reality, you're going to get crazy. You're going to make tomato, chicken, rice, tomato, chicken, fries, zucchini, beef, spaghetti, zucchini, chicken, spaghetti, zucchini, lamb, penne, onion, pork, baked potato, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. And we are not yet done with the main course because remember the heavy chain consists out of a variable region, but then there's also this constant region. And let's just pose these other plates. You have two different colors of plates, so it's not going to change what you eat. So there is a mu plate and a delta plate. That's our constant region. And these are just the first in line. And you're going to learn that there are more than two constant regions, that's actually five, but right now you can't utilize them. So it's just going to be right now there's just two plates available, a mu and a delta plate. And just to prepare for the later antibody lecture, you're going to learn that the constant region of the antibody matters more what you can do with the antibody, so more what you can do with the food. This is going to come up later. So now we're going to continue to cook our meals Remember, the whole purpose was to create as many meals as possible. And now we're going to do the light chain recombination. So the light chain also contributes to our diverse variable region. And when we're going to cook now, we're going to just think about adding dessert. 
And for dessert, we're gonna pick from two categories. So let's say some chocolatey stuff and some fruity stuff. So let's pose the B. Gene segments are our chocolate options and the J segments are our fruity options. And then we still have a plate and it's kappa or lambda. And then we do the same thing. So we're going to do a VJ recombination. So we don't have three gene segments to pick from. We have only two gene segments to pick from in contrast to the heavy chain recombination. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pick one chocolatey dish and one fruity dish. So let's suppose we have here chocolate cherries. We're also going to make caramel cherries, caramel strawberries, chocolate strawberries, chocolate cake, melon, chocolate cake, cherry, Lebkuchen, cherry, Lebkuchen, apple, apple, and so on and so forth. And then it's going to be served on a light gray plate or on a dark gray plate. And that's the constant region being kappa or lambda. And again, who is going to doing all this fancy stuff? It's the rag enzyme. So this is a master cook. This is the enzyme that facilitates this recombination, which is very unique during T and B cell development. So far, we only talked about B cell development and we're also not done yet, but you're going to see that during T cell development, we also have the steps of VDJ and VJ recombination. There's one more thing I want to add about RAG. RAG also generates random short nucleotide sequences between the recombined gene segment. And that's referred as junctional diversity. I'm going to have this in the summary again, but it's not only that RAG mediates co different combinations. It also mediates some random short nucleotide sequences between the recombined gene segments. And that's junctional diversity. So you can think about it if we stick to our um, dinner party that you add or remove randomly then some ingredients. So you cut away a half onion and all of these additional actions let the number of potentially different different dishes explode. So that's going to contribute again tremendously to diversity. So after the heavy and the light chain recombination has occurred, we are dealing now with an immature B cell. And this immature B cell has to pass one test, the so-called negative selection. Here it's going to be tested if it binds too tightly to antigen presented in the bone marrow. If it does that, it should be better dying off because we want to prevent that we get any autoreactive antibodies because after all we are dealing here with bone marrow antigen, so that should be all self-antigen. At one point, this immature B cell will express IgM antibodies on its surface. And later, when it becomes a naive B cell and leaves the bone marrow to recirculate between secondary lymphoid organs, it will express IgM and IgD on its surface. And just if you're wondering why those isotypes, so you can see here this is a constant mu domain and this gives rise to IgM and this is a delta and this gives rise to IgD. And these are just first in line. We're going to learn later that there are many more isotypes of antibodies like IgG, IgA and IgE. And you need to do another process in order to get these different isotypes of antibodies. But if a B cell is immature, it only expresses IgM. It's just the first one that comes. And if it's naive and leaves the lymph node, it expresses IgM and IgD with identical binding sites. So half of the mRNAs are translated into the mu heavy chain and about half of them are translated into the delta heavy chain. But again, they have the exactly same antigen binding site. And so why do we get this? Because um, that's due to alternative mRNA processing. So for some of them, there's a stop right after the mu constant region and others, there's just splicing out of this mu constant region. And then you get the variable region and the delta heavy chain.
And just to sum things up, here's just again an overview figure that you can clearly see these different stages and how the B cell develops. It starts as a pro B cell. And I know it's a little bit counterintuitive because if you're thinking about pro, I always think about professional B cell, but it's actually not. It's totally the opposite. It's a B cell that can do the least, that doesn't even have a B cell receptor. That's a pro B cell. So it doesn't have any receptors, has no idea what's going on. So then it becomes a pre B cell because it rearranges the heavy chain, expresses this pre receptor. It has a surrogate light chain, so it's just a placeholder basically for the light chain because otherwise it would fall apart, would be not stable enough. Now it's a pre-B cell. That makes a little bit more sense. Pre is something like almost there and it is almost there because now the next stage is the immature B cell and now it's the job is basically done. It expresses the B cell receptor but it has to do this one test, the negative selection, and to make sure that we are not going to develop any autoreactive B cells. So we want to make sure that we get a B cell that does not bind too tightly to self. We are still in the bone marrow, so we should not bind all the self antigen. If it does not bind tight to any antigen, it's going to become a naive B cell and will express IgM and IgD. This concludes the video on B-cell development.